get by It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a beach If you find the same like right now I feel like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. I'm excited. I'm going to introduce Yadin Shemmer of Intrinsic in a second. Yadin, I always like to say, what other episodes people should check out? Um, You know, and since Yadin is originally from Israel, we do have a bit, you know, Israel business leader series that I've done. And I've had Yuri Adoni, who, you know, was at Jerusalem Venture Partners, Yossi Vardi, who's done tons of investing. And had him for an interview. We had Kaha Robotics Guy Glass talking about e-commerce. Since this is kind of in the e-commerce space, people can check out that interview with Guy Glass and, and many, many more. Go to inspiredinsider.com. And before I introduce today's guest, this episode is brought to you by Rise 25. At Rise 25, we help, you know, the way I say it is like we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships. And we do that by helping a business run their podcast. And for me, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships, profile the people and the companies I admire. And I've seen no better way to do that over the past over decade than have them on my podcast. So if you have questions, if you've thought of starting a podcast, you should. If you're a business, I 100% believe that everyone is if you have a website, you should have a podcast. Like You wouldn't have a business without a website. And I believe that will be the case for podcasts as well. If you have questions, go to rise25.com and contact us. We're happy to answer any questions that you have. And today's guest, I'm really excited. Yadin Shemmer is the founder and CEO of Intrinsic. And Intrinsic is an inquirer and accelerator of Amazon-focused health and wellness brands. And prior to Intrinsic, he spent 15 years building and running consumer health businesses, including Mango Health, which sold the trial card in 2019, Everyday Health, which sold to Ziff and Davis in 2016 for $467 million and better to know, and many, many more. Started his career in finance as both an M&A advisor and later investor, just a breath of experience over many years. So, Nadine, thanks for joining me. Jeremy, thank you for having me. Now, I want to, there's so many questions I have for you. So um, the first is you have just attracted this amazing group of advisors. Okay. And I'm going to name a few, but I'd love to hear your approach, why you chose the advisors, how you attracted the advisors. You have Dr. Mehmet Oz, Tony Robbins, Lorianne Goldman, who's a former CEO of Spanx and Nick Dennison, former VP at Amazon. So what are you, you know, tell me about how you were able to attract some of these advisors. Well, first, you know, just to say how honored we are and fortunate to have them on board. Um, really, we think they're, they're going to be transformational for us. And, you know, there's really, there, there's no secret sauce or like magic, I think, to attracting these advisors other than being upfront about what you're doing and why it matters. And if it aligns with, with what folks want to do and what they believe in, if folks believe in your mission and they want to be a part of it, you can get, you can get a lot of people involved. And, you know, I was lucky to have been introduced to the four folks you mentioned, so Dr. Oz, Tony Robbins, Lorianne Goldman, and Nick Dennison. I was lucky to be introduced to them, and I laid out the vision for what Intrinsic was doing and the really the why it matters and what we're doing, how we help consumers at the end of the day find better solutions to health and wellness challenges, how we help founders realize their dreams, and that, that resonated with the, the folks that we're talking about. And they agreed to be part of it. Um, and I think, you know, if I have one piece of advice to folks is when you have conversations with, with folks that can move the needle for your business, just be direct and upfront and focus on the why. Focus on what you're doing, why it matters, and why the person should really care how it aligns potentially with, with what their mission is. So, you know, as an example, you know, Dr. Oz has dedicated his career to helping folks uh, better manage their health, better understand their health, and just you know becoming healthier every single day. So obviously, what we're doing resonated with him because we're out there looking for better health solutions every single day to tough challenges. And f- from Tony's perspective, as an example, really our mission aligned well with what he does because he first and foremost is focused on helping people achieve financial freedom and independence. 
And he's also very focused on health and wellness. Uh, and so we, what we're doing here aligns very well with some of his, his mission in life. Um, and Nick and Lori Ann were two execs who built brands and built big businesses and e-commerce. And so from our perspective, that aligned with them. So it's really about alignment, both of mission and vision and, and what you're doing. So I love Tony Robbins stuff, but whatever you love him, you hate him, whatever it is. Um, I used to listen to his audio cassette tapes in my car and he's got great stuff on, you know, personal power. And also he's got, not everyone knows that, but he's got some really rock star stuff on health related um, uh, learnings and materials also. And when you're talking to Tony Robbins or Tony Robbins group, how does that conversation go? How long do they go? Okay. Um, yeah, Dean, you have five minutes. Like how long do they, how is that structured typically uh, when you're talking to them and how many conversations until they're like, okay, yeah, this sounds like a company we want to uh, work with. There, so Jeremy, there is no real structure to any of these conversations, whether it's with a professional investor, whether it's with someone like a, you know, a Nick Dennison or Tony, um, these things aren't formally structured. You know how it is. It's, it's whether or not you're interested in something. And if you are, you make time, right? So you start the conversation. You want to get to the point quick is my, has been my philosophy is don't beat around the bush, really get to the point. Again, what are you doing? Why it matters? What the vision is? How big can it be? And if someone's interested, they make the time and they dig in. So what do you tell them? Because this goes into the next question, which is like, what makes health and wellness really unique? What make, makes, you know, what you do unique? What, what we tell them is, you know, what we're up to, which is there are 7 billion people on the planet. Health and wellness affects every one of them. And, and there's a huge amount of unmet need out there. Folks who are just looking for better solutions, both to everyday ailments, but also to some very serious ailments. And, you know, the search for better health doesn't end at the hospital. Folks are out there looking for better solutions every single day. And if we can identify better health solutions out there and help bring those to people, that's a very powerful, that's a very powerful thing that we get really excited about. So first and foremost, it's about helping consumers find better solutions to healthcare challenges. And second of all, it's about helping entrepreneurs and founders realize their dreams. There are millions of folks on Amazon, both in the U.S. and outside, who have built businesses and are selling on Amazon. You'll, of course, know better than, than, than most, Jeremy. And it's not an easy ride. Um, what we see, and, and this will dovetail into the conversation about why health and wellness is different, is what we see is that most of the founders in our space didn't just get into this to make a quick buck. They are also, they had a higher calling. They're either physicians in many cases who saw something in their practice and decided to build a better version of, of what was out there, or in many cases, they're consumers who had a health issue affect themselves or a loved one, and they were then called to go out and, and improve upon the status quo. So helping them realize their dreams, helping them accelerate their brands and carry on their legacy is also something that we think is meaningful and important and we get really excited about. And that's where I spend most of my time with everybody, whether it's a, a venture capital firm or whether it's you know a celebrity, whatever it may be. I want to hear who are, what's the makeup of an ideal company that you buy um, at Intrinsic? And to your point, I, there's one founder Adine, that I interviewed uh, of Good Day Chocolate and he was a head and neck surgeon and he had these lollipops that were, would numb the back of people's throats so they can do whatever they're going to do. And then he started and they branched off into like chocolates that had a functional, you know, whatever for immune. And, and it's yeah. funny at the time I was like, really like, won't it melt? And, and now they have ones for sleep. And I swear we have our, one of our daughters who has them. And now I swear if they run out, all hell breaks loose. Cause like, <laughs> we need these, we need these sleepy chocolates with melatonin that help. I mean, if any parent is listening, like if your child's staying up too late, it's like crippling sometimes. So, so I totally get what you're saying. And it was out of a, a need that they created these products. So what are, what's an ideal, if a company's listening and they're like, you know what, I'd love to be a part of this intrinsic universe. What, what does that look like? What is the makeup of that company? So there's a couple of, of themes that we look for. One is we look for 
brands that are solving interesting challenges, health and wellness challenges. And the more specific that solution is to a, a problem, I think the more excited we get. There's a lot of generic, I'd say, just broad-based products out there that don't really address a specific need, you know, vitamin C supplement. Those type of things are kind of a little less interesting to us versus something that solves a specific health and wellness need, which we get excited about. Um, businesses that are anywhere between, I'd say, one to $10 million of revenue, profitable, um, growing and in a growing category. Um, folks that have managed to build the beginnings of a, of a brand DNA, you know, whether it's uh, only on Amazon or whether they have a business that goes beyond Amazon, their own shop front on other marketplaces, something that we think is, is brand DNA that we can take and really grow into something bigger. So it's not just about the product, but it's also about the brand um, is important. Um, and we're also looking, I think, and this, this is something that Tony speaks a lot about, we're looking for brands that have really excited consumers, consumers that really get, if not fanatical, incredibly excited about the brand and what the brand is doing and, and how it's helping them. Um, those are the signs that we look for that a brand has a lot of potential. Are there any trends you're seeing now that you're interested in as a company like you know, we're hearing a lot of things on CBD or other things. Like when we say, okay, solves a specific health issue, what sticks out to you? Some of the, some of the things that you looked at would be an example of that. There's so many, um, you know, there's broad themes that I can talk about. One theme is aging. You know, the population is aging and a lot of folks as they approach 65, Medicare and older, they start looking for solutions to better manage the aging process and to give them more independence. You know, a lot of folks just want to stay independent and stay in the home rather than moving into a, a nursing home setting or an acute setting. And so there is a huge amount of products that are out there for seniors that um, whether it's mobility products or braces or um, sleep related products that serve that, that demographic that we look at, we think that's a very exciting theme as, as one example. Um, you know, there's there's so many, Jeremy. It's hard to know where to start. Yeah. No, there's one I that I had on um, natural, the founder of Natural Stacks, and they're a neurotropic, and they help with like because you mentioned the aging thing because people have been. He didn't realize, you know, there were founders entrepreneurs that were using it for concentration, but he found that that aging individuals were taking it for helping increase their concentration and other things and cognition as well. That's one, I think the best intro I've ever had on my whole podcast, which it's, it's from kind of like an ESPN highlights. I'm not going to ruin it. So people check out the natural stacks interview and watch the first five minutes. If you do nothing else, it's, it's really crazy exciting, but, but no, I see what you mean. It's got, it really has to serve a specific functional need. Um, now, do you only want, do you look for a certain mix of Amazon off Amazon, or what do you like to see as far as that goes? We tend to focus on business that are mostly Amazon. So kind of 70, 80% Amazon. Um, we will, in, in some cases, see businesses that are more like 50, 50. Um, some of the businesses that we've come across even have brick and mortar distribution. And um, we'll look at those as well. You know, we're not, we're not fanatic in the way that we screen, but most of the things we tend to focus on are majority Amazon. Got it. And before we go to your past for a second, you built this, um, you know, amazing team. I don't know. It seems like in a short period of time, maybe it was over a long period of time. Talk about how you assembled the team and who's a part of the, the leadership. Yeah. Um, I think the place to start is we were really looking for a broad diverse set of backgrounds. So we wanted to have folks on the team, A, that were native Amazonians that had built Amazon businesses, understood the platform and understood what it was like to be a founder in the space. Um, two is we wanted folks that had come from big brand CPG backgrounds, really understood what it took to get a, a brand from a million dollars of revenue to a hundred of revenue and what that process looks like of marketing merchandising, distribution, manufacturing, sourcing, innovation, end to end the brand building process. Uh, we wanted some folks who had an M&A or private equity background that 
you know, could help us evaluate acquisitions and do acquisitions. Um, and we wanted folks on the team that understood supply chain. And so those are kind of the building blocks. And we were looking for folks really best in the best folks that we could find in those areas and, and to try to attract them. And, you know, I think we're, we're really lucky. We found some fantastic folks that we have, you know, on the team. We've got Aram Hesnain, who has a CPG and a private equity background. We've got Chris Jacalone, who spent nine years at P&G building health and wellness brands. We've got Paul Miller and Mike Duthry, who's a partner of ours, who have, have you know, grown up in the Amazon system before it was even fashionable to build Amazon brands. Uh, really native Amazonians. And then we've got, you know, folks on the team that were supply chain experts for 15 years and uh, understand that process end to end. Yeah. Big shout out to Paul Miller too, uh, who introduced us and uh, people can check out the amazing exits podcast uh, as well. And yeah, you've assembled this really interesting team that spans, you know, really big brand. I mean, some of these people worked in the, you know, P and G probably have some of the the biggest brands out there in this space. Yep. Yeah. P&G is, is huge in the space. There's a couple of very large companies in kind of health consumer products. P&G is one of them. Chris, um, you know, ran some of their biggest health brands when he was there and also spent a lot of time focusing on the Amazon platform within P&G. And so we're just, we're just lucky. We've got an awesome team and we're, we're really excited about what's ahead of us. When you meet with the medical, you have a medical advisory board as well. When you have conversations with the medical advisory board, what are some of the questions you're bringing up with them and and some of the the feedback they give? Yeah. So we're, we wanted to make sure, especially in our space, trust is so important um, and safety is so important. So we wanted to make sure that we had folks that could be a sounding board to us as we were thinking about either brands to acquire, or in some cases, if down the road we decide that we're going to build some of our own brands, just some some uh, practitioners, uh, medical professionals that could give us very just light, you know, perspective on a specific category, um, or it could give us perspective on risk, or efficacy, or alternatives. Just help us think about, hey, should we be in this category, or should we acquire this product, and if so, what are the things we should be thinking about as we evaluate? Give me an example of that. I'd love to hear from a risk perspective. Is there anything they said, yeah, Dean, you know, be careful in this space or be careful with this. What, what have they advised, if anything, and maybe not uh, yet, but um, of just maybe not steering, saying, no, don't do this, but showing you some of the risks. So look, those, those conf- uh, conversations are confidential. Right? So I, I can't, you know, give you specifics, but what I can tell you is, you know, some of the areas that we focus a lot on are ingredients, right? You're buying in in our space, you're buying products that people put in their bodies, on their bodies, they give to a loved one, a child, an an elderly parent. So the stakes are higher and you've got to make sure that everything that you're doing is, is safe and vetted and compliant. So we look at products, we test everything. And um, this advisory board is brand new. So we haven't had a lot of conversations yet. But a lot of the conversations are going to be around, hey, what do you think about this specific product or this class of ingredients? Um, What are some of the things that we should be worried about or diligencing before we acquire? Those are the conversations. I'm curious, Edin, why you started this company? Because you could probably have done anything. You know, like I mentioned, you were better to know than Everyday Health Group, the Mango Health. Um, What made you decide to start a company like Intrinsic? It's a great question. There's a, for me, a couple of things that were um, a, a, a function of my background. So I spent 15 years in, in healthcare um, on the regulated prescription side of things. So healthcare services, healthcare tech. And in the 15 years that I did that, I kind of observed that you had companies with a lot of scale, but actually very low impact on the lives of a human being. And on the other end of the, of the barbell, you had companies that had very limited scale, but, but very high impact. So like you look at the company like Everyday Health that I was at, we had mass scale. We touched 15 million consumers a month, uh, almost a million physicians. But at the end of the day, we were providing them content. So it wasn't that impactful to the, to the health and well-being of people. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, there were companies like Mango, companies like Livongo, they're 
or, or even physician practices or hospitals that, you know, they touch a couple hundred thousand lives, um, but they have a very, very profound, deep impact on, on those lives. And I was really looking for the next thing that I did. I was looking for something that could have large reach and also large impact. And to me, a combination product, of the two. Yeah. And to me, consumer products have that ability, which very few things have. They can touch millions of people and they can have a real profound effect on, on someone's life. So that was mm -hmm. one, um, one thing that really drew me to the business model. And the other was that it's, it's a really interesting hybrid business model. It's half of the business is an investment business where you're trying to find interesting companies and acquire them and partner with founders. And the other half is really an operating uh, business that markets products and deals with manufacturing and supply chain. And to me, having those two sides of the business are just fascinating. It's a lot of moving pieces. Yes. I mean, because part of your job, I mean, you have to um, also probably raise money and then run the business and then also vet businesses that you want to purchase. Which do you find? So from the get go, it's like the chicken and egg, which when you're starting this company, do you have to do all of them simultaneously? Or are there one that you were focused in on first? Like, oh, we got to raise money before we kind of do everything else. It is chicken and the egg. And there's, you know, it's a puzzle piece that you have to get right. Um, you need a little bit of money to just get off the starting blocks. Then you really need a, um, and by the way, even before that, you need a crisp vision of what you're doing, why it matters, how you're going to win in the market and the size of the prize. So kind of basic business planning 101. Once you have that, you need to go find a little bit of money to get off the starting blocks. Then you need to find a team or the beginnings of a team that people can believe in and that folks want to back. Um, then you raise a bunch more money and then you have to actually execute. And so we've gone through all of that. And we're now in, in the phase of we have to execute and go find great brands, acquire them, grow them, and get the machine rolling. You have deep experience in kind of this process of um, purchasing and or being purchased. And I'd love to talk about some of your lessons at when you were at Everyday Health Group. You help navigate, you know, like I mentioned, they ended up selling to Ziff and Davis in 2016 for $467 million. I'd love to hear some of your lessons on helping navigate that process. Yeah, I mean, I was part of the, the senior team there, the business uh, founded by two gentlemen, Ben Wolin and Mike Kariakos. Ben was the CEO of the business. Huge shout out to Ben, not just for that, but, but what, what he's done, I think, for the space in general. Uh, ben was one of the original digital health founders, wave one of digital health in New York City, huge success story, um, and is now the CEO of Covetris. Um, and, um, you know, not many folks can take a business from an idea to a public company to a sale like Ben did. And I was, I was just fortunate and feel lucky to have been on the ride with him. Um, I ran the consumer business for Ben. There was a team of, you know, five, six of us that were the senior team. And, um, you know, that process was, was a fascinating process because we were a public company, you know, and as a public company, when you sell, it's very different than a private company sale. Um, a, it's often bigger. We were, it was a pretty large transaction. B, a lot of the information about you is already out there in the public domain. So the whole due diligence process looks very different than in, in private company sales. Um, and then C, you have a whole bunch of just official approvals and votes that you have to get through for the shareholders to say yes to a deal. Um, and uh, at some point in the 10 year, nine year journey of everyday health, you know, Ben and the board decided it was time to sell and started the process. And, you know, we ended up selling to Ziff. Ziff is a, some of the, some of the folks, some of your uh, viewers may not know, but Ziff Davis is a, is one of the old publishing giants. You know, they had men's health and a bunch of big publications. Um, and they were the ones who eventually acquired us. Um, very interesting process, great result for the company. And, and they've done very well with it since. For example, one of the jewels in our crown, which I talk a lot about to people, is what to expect when you're expecting. And Ziff, after they acquired the business, has also now acquired Baby Center. Mm. So they have, have now gone really deep into pregnancy and baby, which is another category that we love. Mm. 
How was then Mango Health different navigating the sale of Mango Health compared to everyday health? Couldn't be more different in, in every respect. You know, um, it, Mango was, was, was much smaller than everyday health. Um, it was earlier along in its journey, um, ha- had, a, had a good product, had good clinical evidence for the efficacy of that product and had a defined area of really supporting patients around their medications and helping folks get more value from their medications. And so the process of selling mango was, was very different. It was private. It was, um, it was easier and quicker than a public sale process because of that. And so the diligence was, was easier. Um, and it was much more centered around from the buyer's perspective, what could we do if we own this thing? Why did one plus one equal five? It was a lot more focused on the synergies of the businesses. You know, when, when, again, even going back further, your principal investment partner group as well. And I'm curious, you know, through this whole journey, all, you know, through, you know, being CEO, founder, president, um, what are some of the mistakes you've seen people make in this buying and selling process? And maybe you just saw it from, a, it could be also when you were doing the investment partner group as well. Um. There's a lot. I think there's a lot of mistakes. W- one is, I think, one type of mistake that people make in m a is that they they do it for reasons that are driven by financials. They think, hey, this company's profitable. I'm just going to buy revenue and profits, and I'm going to put it together, and it's going to work. And they don't think enough about the strategy. And not all, not all revenue and not all profit is created equal. If the strategy isn't sound for why you're acquiring a company, then um, often it falls apart. And B, often the investors that you were trying to, to kind of impress with this acquisition, they see through it. And so big mistake that I see historically people have made is just thinking that all, all profit is created equal and I'll just go buy it and, and everything will work out. The other big mistake people make is to underestimate culture. And to not think enough about the culture that they have and the culture of the company that they're acquiring and how those two things are going to fit. And where a lot of acquisitions have fallen down is on, is on culture. Mm-hmm. And a lot of ink has been spilt writing about that specific mistake of not you know, focusing enough on the people and the culture and how they come together. Uh, so those are two, two big mistakes that I've seen. I love that. Yeah, I, I didn't know what you were going to say there, but integrating culture does seem like it, it's an obvious, it's like a head slap. Oh, that seems obvious, but it's not something that was top of mind. So one is, you know, if you go just adding revenue is just not enough. I mean, that's just not enough of a reason. And, and I think that's your next book, getting is like something about integrating culture. What what are some things people can do to help integrate culture? Because you've done it across several companies. You're going to do it with all these other companies that get uh, get absorbed into intrinsic. What are some things that you look at of how to best integrate culture once you acquire a company? I think it starts with understanding culture and being honest with yourself about what your culture is and, and the culture of the company you're buying. I, I think a lot of folks see this as an afterthought of, hey, I'm going to buy it. It makes sense. And we'll figure out the people on the culture side later. Huge mistake. So number one, just being honest about what you are and then understanding the culture you're acquiring. And I think, I think two is starting with the folks that on the other side and in your company, in any company, there tend to be folks that um, are leaders, whether or not officially by title or not, you know, who are the real, you know, standard bearers, the flag bearers for the culture, getting those folks together and seeing if there's a meeting of the minds on each other's culture. And if this is actually going to work, um, and then I think the third thing that is just so critical is just communication, is how do you communicate to everybody in the company up and down how you want them to behave and how you want them to act on a day-to-day basis? One of the books that's really influenced me on culture is the Ben Horowitz book. I'm not sure if you've read it, but uh, you know, who you are is what you do. And um, or maybe it's the other way around. What you do is who you are where he talks about culture a lot, corporate culture, and it's really about action. It's not about, you know, some 
a set of values or beliefs that are kind of just written down somewhere. It's really about how people behave every single day, how they make decisions. And so communicating very clearly what this is going to be, how you want folks to behave, um, and doing as much pre-work on that before the deal gets done with the folks on the other side that kind of drive it to see if there's a gelling there. Yeah. I would love to hear any other influential books. And yeah, I was looking at it is what you do is who you are. And yeah. uh, I, I haven't listened to that one, actually, but I have to. The hard thing about hard things is the one that I have listened to, which was which is which is a great storytelling. I mean, the book is phenomenal as far as storytelling goes. Are there any other books that have influenced you in leadership or business? There's that book. There's the Andy Grove book, which I thought was really short and concise and just memorable on on what leaders should be doing. Um, there's a Simon Sanic book, which someone I worked with at Everyday Health gave me, and um, I'm thankful to her for doing that. She she. Uh, uh, she gave me that about leadership. Those are three that come to mind. Mm -hmm. When you, so, you know, in your background is University of Penn psychology. You went to, you know, got an MBA at London Business School. When you were growing up, what did you want to be? Did you want to do something in business? What was your, you know, I didn't know. I, I was always envious of folks who kind of knew from a very early age what they wanted to do and just stuck with it. I didn't really know and I didn't have a master plan. I just went where opportunity kind of unfolded along the way for me. And it, and it turned out about 15 years ago that this opportunity to build a business with a friend of mine opened up in healthcare. And really from the first you know, couple of weeks of stepping into that, I kind of knew healthcare was going to be my thing. Um, it just resonated with me. There was a nobility to it that I liked. There was a clear need and a helping people that I thought was important. And it was, it was clear that I was going to do that. Um, so I didn't have a plan. I wish I could tell you I did, um, but I, I fell into healthcare and I'm so happy I did. Yeah. yeah, I didn't know if you had like a family member or someone that was in in this space. Because um, when you were young, I mean, you came, you came from Israel to New York and I think you said you were eight. Yes. Um, what was it like moving just to a different country when in the, you know, I'm just trying to think one of my daughters is is nine, just like plucking her, boom, putting her in. She would hate me, I think, um, because I take her away from her friends or whatever the case is. What was it like for you? And then you're going to a totally different country. Yeah, um, it was hard. We moved around a bunch. We moved around like four or five times before I was 16. So it was difficult. And you basically, my main lesson for that was just how to adapt Mm. And how to change and be flexible because you could just get dropped in somewhere, new school, new language, new country, and, and you're just told, like, to figure it out. Good luck. Yeah, good luck. Where did you move? Where were the places that you moved? M moved from Israel to New York, first to Queens, then to, to the city itself, then to Westchester, then back to Israel um, mm. when, when I was in high school. So, what was the toughest part about the transition moving from Israel to the States? I was young. I was eight. So I don't remember, you know, mm -hmm. very much from, from that age, but um, just different school system, new friends, uh, new language. The whole thing was, the whole thing was hard. Yeah. So you lesson, you just, you just had to adapt. Yeah. In general. Yeah. What's the difference between the culture? You've been back a bunch of times, obviously. What do you see as the big differences between the culture in Israel and the U S? Um, because you, you mentioned right off the bat, you know, with the, the advisory board, right? You're like, you just got to be upfront. You just got to be to the point. And I feel like that's kind of Israeli MO, right? I mean, that's just the yeah. culture of, I mean, that, that's my stereotype of Israeli culture a little bit. Like you're just to the point. Yeah, there's to the point and there's a fine line between being to the point and, you know, being polite. You got to walk the line. But um, that's one of the differences. And that's one of the kind of national traits, I think, of Israel is being very direct, very open um, about everything, which, which is great. I think there's also a, just a get shit done mentality in, in Israel, which is why I think entrepreneurship there has been so successful. Right? For a country that's that small, to have that many successful companies come out is, is pretty impressive pound for pound. And a lot of it is just down to the hustle. Um, 
I think there's a support structure there too, like a deeper support structure at the family level and at the national level, which enables risk taking in a way that you have here in some places, but not in all places. Um, and, you know, I think the other side of the coin is, yes, you have a lot of entrepreneurial hustle in Israel and a lot of just go get it and be scrappy and find a way. And I think where some of that has flipped historically, at least, but it's changing a bit now is, is once a business gets to scale, how do you then build the processes and the structure and the incentives to, to build a really large business afterwards? And I think a lot of Israeli companies, historically at least, had managed to go from zero to one very successfully, but then had struggled to build very large businesses in the back end, which is where I think the American culture is so good at. You know, it's how do we really build a machine that can scale? Um, but I think Israel has matured a lot in the past two decades. And you're starting to see unicorns. I think there's like 40 unicorns now in Israel across every category, uh, many of which are now public in America. So that is even changing. Management has matured in Israel too. Eugene, I have one last question for you. First of all, thank you. Thanks for sharing the story. Thanks for sharing your journey. Um, and I want to ask you uh, about anything else that people should know about Intrinsic that we miss. But before you answer it, I want to point people to Intrinsic.us. Check out what they have going on there. If you are an e-commerce brand, specifically like we talked about in the health and wellness space, it could be you know, larger portion Amazon. But in general, just reach out and they're looking for great brands to acquire. And if they meet a specific need in this new, you know, health and wellness space, reach out and have a conversation. They have a really, really smart team there. So you can go to intrinsic.us and learn more and contact them there. Um, check out more episodes of the podcast, uh, Inspired Insider and Rise 25. So um, what else do we need to mention, Yadin, um, that we haven't chatted about yet about Intrinsic that you think people should know? I think the big things are health and wellness is all we do. Health, wellness, personal care. That's our sole focus. We're not out there buying in, in other categories. It's our only focus because it's what we care about. It's our mission. It's what we've all done as individuals for decades. And we think it matters. So if folks are in the space you know, I, I would just highlight that we we share their mission and we want to be good stewards for their brands, first and foremost. Um, secondly, uh, we we think we can help these brands find a much larger stage, both on and off Amazon. And we built the team and the relationships and the partnerships to do that. Um, and third, it, for us, it's not just about the transaction. Yes, we're looking to acquire brands, but there's also what lies beyond the transaction, which is we want to build a community of like-minded folks in the space who are, who are working in health and wellness and trying to improve on the status quo. And that community is going to transcend just the deal and hopefully help folks find the next thing they want to do after they sell and build a really large business on the back end. So we want to be part of the story for an entrepreneur, not just when they're selling to us, but also afterwards. Yeah, Dean, I'm going to be the first one to thank you. Thank you, everyone. Check out intrinsic.us. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks for having me. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out.